Time to recap. There's been a lot going on, including a trip to the Midwest, Northeast, East Coast. Yeah, anyway, first stop, Cleveland. Pretty awesome city, home to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the Cleveland Cavs, the Indians, and of course the Cleveland Browns, but no one wants to watch them play anyway, right? Also, some of the most interesting beer and food selection around little spots throughout the city that I've seen in a while. And on top of all that, one of the best coffee shops that I've tried in pretty much uh, since I've started drinking coffee last year. It's called Civilization. If you're in the area, I highly recommend that you check it out. As far as poker goes, only one real option here, at least for legal poker, Jack Casino. This place was pretty sick. It looked like an old warehouse or department store or something turned into a casino. It's like multi-level, three or four stories, I think. And the best part is the entire top floor is dedicated to just poker. So that's not really something I'm used to in the LA area or even Vegas for that matter. I don't see a lot of multi-level casinos. So despite coming down with the cold, losing my voice and running like absolute death, I actually had a pretty good time here. In fact, while we're here, let's go over some hands real quick. I usually try to avoid bat beat stories, but for the sake of this episode's storytelling, let's go over some of these real quick. None of them are really that complicated, except for maybe the last one has a little bit of decision points, but all the rest, well, you'll see. Starting off with the first hand, picked up ace king suited from early position, made an open, got three bit on my left. When it got back to me, we weren't very deep considering that it was a straddled pot. So I just sent it in for the $300, playing one three no limit here, by the way, and for 300. The player on my left calls fairly quickly. We're up against ace queen, but end up losing that one. Hand after that, turned a set with pocket tens on a king high board, put out a bet in position and got called. River came a queen, put out another bet for value after he checks it over to us, gets snap called, and we lose against ace jack, which for some reason didn't put in a raise. Maybe because backdoor flush draw came in? I guess, I mean, that's gotta be that, right? A few hours later, we managed to get all in with king queen on king 844 and ended up losing to 83 offsuit for a decent amount of money. I think it was like 60 or 70 big blinds, which in this game was, you know, around 200 bucks. So not life changing money, but still not really that fun to lose hands like those. I'm so fucking mega tilted right now. Next hand's likely the only one with any sort of decisions involved. Open king queen of clubs from under the gun to 15. Face a raise from the player on my direct left to 30, so just a min raise. The button calls, and when the action gets back to me, I make the call. So we see it three ways. Comes down a six deuce with two clubs. Ace of clubs is out there, so we flop the nut flush draw, and that's about it. Maybe backdoor straight draw. I check it. The player on my left continues for $40. The button makes the call, and I make the call. So still three ways to a turn, which comes in off to eight. No improvement to our hand, so I decide to check it once again. Player on my left continues for $75. The button makes the call, and I once again make the call. We're all around 300 or more effective here. Didn't write down the stack sizes, but there's still pretty decent money behind to uh, continue drawing to the nut flush. River comes the king of hearts. So we end up making second pair. No need to bet here, obviously. So I check it for a third time. This time the player on my left checks and the button puts out a bet of $100. 
Action's back on me, and I'm pretty sure that we're ahead of the button. This player had been really splashy and frankly just not a very strong player, so I'm not too worried about him. But the player on my left seems somewhat solid, so I expect he's doing this with top pair with the intention of calling a bluff. So I decide to make a somewhat disciplined fold considering that he's still left to act behind me and sure enough he flicks in the call and we get to see both of these players cards. The button shows 5 deuce offsuit which the player on my left can beat showing ace 10 suited. So almost fell in a small trap there at the end after the button put out a bet but got away from it. So ended up losing around 11 or 1200 something like that in Cleveland. Not really a great result, obviously, but I still had a great time. I met a bunch of people who watched the vlogs. That was awesome. And also just had an overall fun experience regardless of the result. I did find some consolation at the Airbnb we stayed at, though. They offered a little something for people who stayed there, which uh, can help cheer up your spirits. I'll give you guys three guesses as to what they had in my Airbnb that helped me feel much better after losing a G in the casino. Nope. Nope. Nope, you're all wrong. What they had was... Before leaving Cleveland, we decided to make one last stop at a place called the Rocky River Reservation in Ohio. You know, after you spend hours inside of a dark casino, it kind of makes you just want to go outside and appreciate nature a little bit. You know what I mean? The drive from Cleveland to Detroit is about two and a half hours. In fact, here's a little map for those of you guys who aren't too familiar with the area, because I certainly wasn't. We started out in Cleveland and then moved northwest around Lake Erie, passed through Cedar Point, which by the way is one of the best amusement parks I've ever been to, then passed Toledo, which also has a casino, before finally hitting Michigan. You keep driving north for a little bit and finally arrive in Detroit. Unlike Cleveland, there's a lot of options here for poker. First off, you have Motor City Casino, then across the street is MGM Grand. These two are, I think, the main competitors in the city. Off to the side a little bit, you have Greek Town Casino, which is a little more run down, a little more divey, but if you guys are anything like me, you enjoy places like that just as much, if not more, than the major poker rooms. And then 10 minutes, uh, that would be southeast, I believe. You have Canada, which you drive underneath a tunnel. I think it's the Detroit River that it goes underneath. And boom, you're in Canada. So in there, they have Caesars Windsor, which obviously you play with Canadian money, and I'll get to that in a little bit. But first stop for this Detroit trip, Motor City Casino. This casino was also multi-level, so again, not something I'm used to, so after around 20 or 25 minutes, finally managed to find the poker room. A little embarrassing how long it took us, but anyway, first thing I noticed in the poker room, free food for anyone who plays poker. It's not really top of the line stuff, but compared to LA, any free food in the poker room is pretty cool. They also have free soft drinks, free snacks, all that stuff, so that was pretty cool. But uh, moving on, when I'm on vacation playing poker, I'm not really trying to win or lose a bunch of money. My main goal is just to have fun and meet people, just, you know, relax and gamble, not really like go full battle mode. So for those reasons, instead of buying $1,000 in chips and heading into the 2-5 game, I decided to take it a bit easier and buy in for 300 play some 1-2 no limit. I'm not trying to sound all big time, by the way. 300 is still no small chunk of change, but certainly less stressful than $1,000 at a 2-5 game filled with 
quite a bit of regs from what I gathered. So one, two, in for 300 and managed to get into a few interesting spots here as well. So let's go over some hands, shall we? This first hand, we look down at ace jack off suit, open it up to $10 and get called by just the hijack. So heads up to a flop of ace, six, deuce, rainbow. Pretty dry flop. It's one of those boards where we're either gonna be way ahead or way behind. And against an aggressive opponent who actually was probably the only aggressive opponent at this one, two game, I think it's good to sometimes check top pair here. Makes it easier to play the hand out of position moving forward. So this time I decided to check it and he checks it back. The turn comes the jack of hearts bringing in two hearts on the board. Obviously we have top two pairs now, so I think it's time to start building the pot. I bet $15 and he doesn't think too long before making the call. So off to a river, which comes the queen of diamonds. I decide to check it. There might be more value in just letting him value bet worse or potentially turn his hand into a bluff since we block so many of the strong holdings on this board. He bets $35. I could put in a raise here, but I don't think we're really getting called by worse except maybe like queen jack. But aside from that, not really worse that can call a check raise on this river. So I make the call and he shows us an ace of hearts without showing the other card. I just show my cards and we're good. So scooping the first one here at Motor City. Next hand, there's an under the gun open to $12, two callers in between, and I look down at ace deuce offsuit from the small blind. Obviously not really a great hand, but when I look at the under the gun player stack, he only has around 40 or 50 bucks left. So unless he's got a bigger ace than us, we're never gonna be in terrible shape. And I think it could be a good spot to squeeze out the players behind him and just get heads up with him, considering that there's dead money in the field. So we don't need much equity to make this a plus EV play. All this nerdy talk just means I raised it up to $55. He makes the call after thinking for a little bit and the players behind indeed get out of the way. Fortunately, we're in much better shape than expected. He shows King Jack suited, I believe it was. Board runs out ace high and we managed to take this one down. Next, we look down at pocket jacks from middle position. There's an early position limp. I decide to make it $12. The button makes the call and the early position limper makes the call. So three ways to a flop, which comes down six, four, three with two hearts. Early position checks. I decide to continue betting for $25. Button makes a fold and the early position player makes the call. So heads up in position to a pretty sweet looking turn card, the Jack of Diamonds. So we make top set. Even better is that he leads for $25 on this turn. That's pretty interesting. I look at his stack and he only has around 150 or 200 left. But then upon closer inspection, I realized that he has a stack of black chips or green chips or something, some bigger denomination chips behind his red $5 chips. So a little bit of Alec Torelli action going on here. I asked him to show and he actually has me covered and I have around 400 or 450 to start the hand. I decided to go with $90 total as the race size. He doesn't think too long and makes the fold. So not a lot of action after turning top set, but I think the play when you have really strong hands is just to try to build the pot and hope that your opponent has something. Last hand from Motor City is by far the most interesting. I think there's three limpers and I look down at four deuce of spades. The player on my left has posted, so he has a dead blind out there. I think you could get away with a raise, fold, or call here. They all seem to have some merit. I decided to just get passive and limp in. I'd been raising a bunch and just didn't feel like the table flow would give me a lot of credit at this point. Player on my left checks, and when it gets to the button, he decides to raise it up to $18. Once again, I think this was probably the most capable player at this table. Usually at 1-2 games, you're not going to see a lot of players who have a ton of experience, but this guy seemed like he knew what he was doing. So when the action gets back to me, I decided to put in the call. Not really advised to limp call with four high out of position against a solid player, but we've been going back and forth with a little bit of banter. I believe his name was Kenji. So Kenji, if you're watching this, shout out to you. I decided to get in there and mix it up with him. So heads up to a flop of 987 with two diamonds, one spade. I check it and he decides to bet $20. I think he'd be doing this with his entire raising range, which obviously includes two overcards. And if he does have two overcards, I think we can certainly win this pot on later streets, especially if the runout favors our limp calling range more than his raising range. So I decided to put in the call. 
Turn comes the six of hearts. That's one of those good cards where I could represent a lot of stuff. So I decided to leave for $45 here. We can have two pairs, straights, and all kinds of other garbage. He thinks a bit and makes the call, which I somewhat expected. So planning on bombing a lot of river cards here. Problem is at this point, I notice he only has like a hundred bucks behind. Not really that optimal when you're trying to go for a river bluff to have less than a pot size bet behind. But when the river comes the nine of spades, there's really only one way to win here. And it's just to represent that range advantage on this nasty board. So I decide to go all in. He doesn't think too long and folds king jack of spades face up. So we get it through. Obviously not really the biggest achievement to fold out king high. But uh, yeah, happy with how four high turned out that time. In total, made around 200 bucks here at Motor City. Decided to call it a session and head across the border to Windsor, Canada, where we were staying the night. At this point, I think it was like midnight or 1 a.m. And the next day, we already had plans, and that was going to be our last day. So if I was going to play in Canada, tonight is the only night I had. And I decided I don't want to leave without getting to play with some Canadian funny money. So we crossed the border and instead of going to bed, decided to head into Caesars Windsor at around 2 a.m. and squeeze out like a 30 minute or one hour session of one, two in for 300 Canadian dollars. First thing I noticed, they play 10 handed at Caesars Windsor. What kind of criminal activity is that? 10 handed in a cash game? <sighs> anyway, no interesting spots here. I managed to win around 20 something dollars, but they charge you when they convert at the cage from Canadian dollars back to US dollars. And after the conversion rate, I actually ended up losing $6. So that was my first time losing and winning a session all at the same time. The next morning, we decided to drive back across the border and play one last session of Texas Hold'em at a little casino you might've heard of called MGM Grand. They got one here in Detroit session. I'll just spoil it for you guys right now. Not really that interesting, but I did get some pretty dope drone shots. Unfortunately, nothing interesting here at MGM Grand. Car dead for most of the time. I did flop a set of eights and won $16. So that was pretty exciting. Just chipped away at a bunch of little pots, ended up booking a win of like hundred bucks or something playing one, two. So nothing major. After that, it was time to catch that flight back to Los Angeles. Totals for the trip, minus eight or 900, something like that total for poker. Obviously not really the result I was looking for, but of course, we're not always in control of these things. Variance is pretty much going to be king when you're playing for one or two days at certain places. So after that, as mentioned, it was time to catch that flight home. And that brings us on the timeline to this past weekend, which if you're watching this, the day it comes out, it should be a Tuesday. So four or five days ago, something like that, decided to play some two five at Morongo and try to recover some of those losses. Certainly got into some interesting spots here, though. First hand of note, I opened pocket kings from middle position to 30. The straddle was on. Folded to the big blind who is a pretty tight passive player. He makes a comment about being tired of me raising and decides to make it 140 to go. Action gets back to me. Normally when a player makes a comment like this, it's actually pretty strong. They're just trying to make it sound like they're not. So I decided to proceed with just a call. It's also good to have some strong hands in a calling range here pre-flop especially considering that we're gonna be in position. So most of the time should be raising, but I think a call is fine too. That's what I do this time. Board comes down pretty good for Pocket Kings. It's 733 Rainbow. The preflop raiser wastes no time and sticks his remaining stack in there, which was $850. And I cover him. So a massive overbit jam here on the flop. It seems to me like he's got a pair that he just doesn't know how to proceed with and decides to just completely spaz out. 
If he had aces, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to do this. Wouldn't he want to get max value and not fold out hands like pocket eights, nines, tens, which would obviously fold to an all in here. So I don't think for too long I decided to make the call. Lo and behold, he had aces. I don't even understand who plays aces like that. I mean, he owned me, right? Because we got all the money in. But uh, anyway, no problem. Turns a king and uh, clean river. So yeah, I'm really, really good at poker, as you guys can tell. Next hand's a doozy. There's a bunch of limpers, and I decided to over limp with 10-9 of spades in the small blind. Big blind check. So multi-way limped pot comes down 10-9-4 rainbow. I decide to leave for 20 into $25. The under the gun limper makes the call and the button makes the call. So three ways to a turn, which comes a six of diamonds, bringing in a backdoor flush draw. I decide to check it. For the most part, I think betting here is probably a better play, but checking seems fine too if the players behind are the aggressive bluffy type, which both of these guys were. So check, under the gun decides to bet $70 and the button raises to $200. I would classify this guy as a maniac, but that still doesn't really seem like an air ball considering that the board is so dry. When the action gets back to me, the under the gun player has around 450 behind and the button after his $200 raise has like 700. I cover both of these players. I have around 2000 in my stack at this point. So it's a tricky spot. Raising seems ridiculous. Folding seems a bit too weak, especially after under representing the strength of our hand with a turn check. And calling doesn't seem that great either because then it reopens the action to the under the gun player. So I think the best play here is to call with the intention of folding if the under the gun player back raises all in, which would be extremely strong at that point. So after thinking for quite a while, I decided to just make the call. And indeed the under the gun player moves in for 450. The button snap calls the 450, actions back to us and it's 250 to call, but the button has around 250 left after the call. So instead of calling, I think the best play here is to either fold or move all in and get a side pot against the button, who I think I'm ahead of, but could have equity against our hand. If we're behind the under the gun player and we're gonna decide to go with it anyway, obviously the best play is to get max value from the button's hand and uh, hopefully hold against whatever the uh, under the gun player has if we're ahead. It's kind of confusing. I got to admit, I got a little bit lost in this spot. And after looking back on paper, I think I should just be folding once the uh, under the gun player goes all in on the turn here. My intention was to fold. And then for some reason, when the action got back to me, I somehow talked myself into thinking the under the gun player could have a slow played over pair some percentage of the time since usually under the gun limps could consist of hands like aces and kings, or he could have uh, just top pair since I checked the turn, he could just be trying to take it down. And then once the button raises and I make the call, he might believe that top pair is ahead and we both have some sort of draw, so he ships it in with that. Seems a bit optimistic. And uh, again, I'm not trying to be results oriented. I think a fold once the uh, back raise all in comes in is the best play, but anyway, as played, I decide to go all in. The button makes the call right away. So we have a side pot between myself and the button of around $500. We all show our cards. Obviously I have top two. The under the gun player has pocket fours for bottom set. And the button has ace four of diamonds, I think it was, for bottom pair with a flush draw. So pretty action flop. I think the best players manage to get away from coolers like these, at least at some point. So happy to say I'm not in that category yet since like uh, a, you know, average player, I got it all in with top two pair and the river brought a diamond. So I lost the side pot as well. Fucking mega tilted right now. Lost a good amount of money in that hand where I could have just got away with losing around 220 bucks or so. <sighs> Hindsight's always 2020. Don't really love how I played it, but uh, it was a pretty interesting hand nonetheless. So those were the two interesting spots from Friday. On Saturday, I worked on this vlog pretty much all day. And yesterday, which was Sunday, I headed back out to Morongo and jumped into 2-5 once again. First fun hand comes in early on with an early position limp. The button makes it $25 and I look down at pocket aces in the small blind, raise it up to $90. And when it folds back to the early position limper, he actually decides to back raise all in. For a little under $500, the button makes the fold and I happily make the call, obviously. Board comes out ace high, so obviously we're scooping this one and get off to a pretty hot start here on the Sunday session. 
Next interesting hand, I open pocket queens from early position. I get three callers on my left, and luckily, the big blind must be a fan of the vlog or something because he raises it up to $40, opening the action back to me. This gives me the chance to raise, which I like to do. I make it 155. Everyone else folds except for the big blind. So heads up in position to a somewhat mixed feelings flop. It comes jack 10 3 with two spades out there. He checks it over to me, and I think I want to check back here. We're either going to be way ahead or way behind. I don't think he's going to have ace-king as just a call pre-flop, and ace-queen we block. So not really too worried about over cards. I think for the most part, he's going to have pocket pairs between like pocket sevens and pocket jacks. So I think the best play here is to check back and control the pot against flop sets, and maybe even let him spaz out and bluff with under pairs to the board on certain turn cards, since I expect him to sometimes put me on ace king once we check back this flop. So check, check, off to a turn card, which isn't really that great, the king of hearts. He checks it once again, and at this point, I think it's best to check back for a second time. Not really sure what worse hands could call us at this point, so check, check again on the turn. River comes another low card. He checks it for a third time, and I think I wanna put in a small, very, very thin value bet here to get called by hands like sevens and eights. So when he checks it for a third time, I decide to bet $55. Very tiny bet. This is not a balanced spot whatsoever. I'm really not gonna have any bluffs for this sizing, but at the lower stakes, being balanced isn't always the uh, optimal route for making a little more money. So when he checks it to me and I bet 55, he actually ends up calling. I show the queens and we're good. So it seems like we got max value. Not really sure what he had, but I'll take it. Sun is setting here, so I gotta make this last hand quick before we lose light. Once again, we're looking down at the beautiful pocket aces. There's an early position raised to $25 from a pretty competent player. I decided to three bet and make it, I think I did 80 or 85 or something like that. And he makes the call. We're 500 effective. I cover him by actually quite a bit at this point. Heads up to a flop, which comes down king jack five with two hearts. He checks it over to me. And at this point, we don't have that much money relative to the size of the pot. So I think it's okay to check back here in position. I don't think there's gonna be a problem getting all the money in by the river so against a capable opponent who i think could bluff if he senses weakness i decided to check back and see what happens on the turn turn comes a six of spades so two flush draws on board now we actually block both of the nut flush draws not really sure how relevant that is but uh, when he checks it to me i think it's definitely time to start going for value here so i make it 100 dollars doesn't think too long and makes the call. So heads up to a river, which comes an offsuit six. Pretty great card. If he had a hand like King Jack and was trapping, somehow didn't raise the turn, we're obviously beating those holdings now. And also both of the flush draws missed, which if he somehow puts me on a flush draw, which seems a bit unlikely considering that flush draws are a little less common in three bet pots. He might call off a little bit lighter here since the six is a pretty big brick. So when he checks it to me, he only has around 300 or 250 left at this point i think it was pretty easy all in i think so that's what i do and he doesn't think too long and makes the call i show the aces and we're good later on he told us he had king queen of diamonds seems like a pretty logical holding to have there he actually asked me what i would do in his shoes and uh honestly i don't know that's a pretty tough spot but luckily we were the one with the uh the easy hand to play in this case so overall Ended up booking two pretty giant wins this weekend at Morongo. I'm happy to report all the losses from Cleveland are uh, fully restored and then some. Timeline for now is to just grind. I'm happy to be back in California, happy to be back making these videos, happy to uh, just be you know back home. Actually, speaking of new videos, how would you guys like to take some cash from myself or maybe Johnny Vibes? Yeah, that sounds good, right? Well, guess what? This Thursday, you can. He's hosting a meetup game at Hamul Casino in San Diego, and he asked me to uh, attend and let you fine folks know that you're all welcome to go as well. If any of you guys don't know Johnny Vibes, he's another poker vlogger. I highly recommend you check out his channel. It's pretty awesome. But yeah, we're both gonna be there uh, playing some one, three and two, five this Thursday, which if you're watching this on a Tuesday, will be two days from when you're watching. So if you have plans, cancel them. If it's your birthday, no one cares. If you have plans with your girlfriend, let her know you can't make it. Just come gamble. That's gotta be priority number one. All right, we're totally running out of light here. Gotta wrap things up. Thank you guys as always for watching. Thank you for the support. Thank you for giving this video a thumbs up if you did. This one in particular took a lot of editing, so 
I would really appreciate that. I hope to see you guys this Thursday, and uh, until then, good luck at the tables, but not good luck on Thursday, because I'll be playing. Okay, bye.